all right welcome back to the class uh, we just before the break we started to look at how the old testament scriptures were transmitted through the ages was it accurate was it ca done carefully uh, so um, we saw that in the early 1900s i think maybe the people in the early 1900s had no other work so they kept uh, did a lot of criticizing and all of that but yeah so they said this 935 ad document which is, which we have with us yes it's been written by the masoretes those people who were very careful about how they did the copies but how do we know whether that copy which they have written you know is from some source document which is identical to the original scriptures which were written by moses by isaiah what is the guarantee that you know accuracy was preserved over the ages that was the um, question which these critics raised and the discovery of the dead sea scrolls helped a lot in you know settling these arguments um so let's look at a little a little, a little bit at the background of the dead sea scrolls now about about 300 years before the birth of jesus christ um you know these were called uh, generally called the silent years because malachi was the last prophet through whom god spoke directly and the lord in fact warned the israelites that after that even if they long to hear his voice they will not hear it you know until that person comes who will prepare a way in the wilderness you know and straighten the paths for the messiah so this was all prophesied in the you know in the old testament and so during the silent years after malachi is gone and now you no longer have the prophets actively speaking so during that time um they were are about 300 years before the birth of christ there were this godly group of jewish people who were very displeased by what they were seeing in the jerusalem temple the people had become so corrupt no one was honoring god uh all the rituals which they are supposed to perform are now just superficial uh you know outward external actions there is no repentance there is no genuineness and so this group of jewish people they decided that they would go away they would separate themselves from this corrupt community and they would go and live out in the wilderness where they would devote themselves to spending time with god learning his scriptures growing in him and uh, so this community began or uh, came to be known later as the qumran community they were a group of people called the essenes e s s e n e s so they were the essenes people um so th this community started to live out in the judean desert and they would no longer mingle with the corrupt people of jerusalem and so they spent their entire time in prayer and meditation upon the scriptures and they also began to make a lot of hand copies of all the scrolls so this is basically what they were doing for almost around um, uh, yeah 370 um, years so um, around the time when you know before the birth of jesus the uh, the, the the romans began to attack and uh, so the invading armies the roman invading armies began to you know destroy um the 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 what do you call them the synagogues you know they began to attack the the jewish people uh, spiritually so when all that was going on uh, these essenes they thought to themselves it's risky if this one of the if, if one of these invading roman armies comes to the judean desert and destroys all the scrolls which we have so carefully copied out you know it would create a lot of harm and so they took their entire collection of scrolls and they hid them in caves so uh, then of course jesus was born uh, you know he did his ministry and then finally in ad 70 is when you have uh, the roman general titus he comes he completely destroys the jerusalem temple and at that at that time he also attacked the essenes community most of them were killed uh, but even though they died the scrolls which they had carefully hidden away in the caves those remained safe and so for the next 2000 years nobody even saw those scrolls all very carefully safely hidden away by god in the caves near the dead sea finally it was in 1947 2000 years later 
that a shepherd accidentally discovered the caves. He found the scrolls which are there inside. And uh, so, um, you know, um, totally 11 caves were found with scrolls stored inside. Now, why is this an interesting thing for us? Because you see that 935 AD document, that complete copy of the Old Testament, you know, which, is, which, which was hand copied in 935 AD, these scrolls are 1,000 years earlier than this 935 AD manuscript. So the critics were very, very curious. They wanted to compare the Dead Sea Scrolls with this 935 AD manuscript to see how many defects there will be in the 935 AD manuscript. And when they did a comparison, a careful line by line comparison, except for some spelling mistakes, they could not find any major defects. No teaching was changed. No doctrine was affected. Accuracy was preserved. And so they realized for, you know, for a, for a, for a thousand years. So when the um, Essenese community made copies and then um, they perished, other people continued making copies till finally someone made a copy in 935 AD. In that entire span of time, accuracy had been maintained. Yes, small spelling mistakes were there here and there, but no major teaching was affected. Some names changed, some numbers changed because of you no know, the, the the copyists were a little careless in the way they copied. So you know some numbers changed, names changed, some sentences changed, but no doctrine, no teaching in the Old Testament was touched. So it was completely laid to rest. You know this fact that the transmission of the Old Testament was done most carefully, most accurately. So if you were to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, they were written um, over a long period of time, right? Right from the time uh, from about 300 years before the birth of Christ, all the way up to AD 70, the different copies were made. And then, you know, these were stored in the, in the caves. So among them, one of the oldest manuscripts that we find is one portion of the book of Samuel. Yeah, which is almost 300 BC. Uh, yeah, so that is one of the oldest manuscripts found in the uh, in the in the caves. And of course, there, there were two Isaiah scrolls which were discovered, and um, that was also a very helpful find uh, because those two Isaiah scrolls proved that one single Isaiah wrote the entire Isaiah. Uh, and, and not three different Isaiahs. Now, we talked about that in the Old Testament course, so we will not touch upon it now. Um, so the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls helped prove that the transmission of the Old Testament scriptures was done very carefully, always. Let's look at the New Testament. How reliable is the New Testament? New Testament is highly reliable because the writings was, uh, were written almost immediately after Christ's ascension, like no time was left, you know, in between for, uh, for wrong um, uh, ideas to come in, for memories to fade and people to forget the details. Almost immediately after Jesus' ascension, these uh, New Testament writings began to uh, be written down. Um, so the crucifixion of Jesus was probably around 30 AD. About two years after that, in 32 AD is when Paul uh, becomes a believer. You know, he has his uh, encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and uh, he becomes a, a follower of Jesus. About two years after Jesus' um, resurrect, uh, resurrection and ascension. And immediately after he becomes a believer, he starts, you know, preaching in all the synagogues about how Jesus is uh, the true Messiah. And um, he begins to write his epistles. First Corinthians is one of the first letters which he writes. Uh, so they say that maybe he wrote it in in uh, around 40 AD. Um, 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 yeah, around 40 AD is when he would have written it. So at, at this time, you know, the Jerusalem temple has not even fallen. I mean, Titus has not come and even attacked as yet. So right there in those early days itself, Paul and the others began to do their writing. Now, why is this important? Because you see, whatever they are writing, not only will the believer community read those things, even the hostile Jews also will be reading it. And so if they have written any tall stories which are not true, if they've written fiction over there, 
the Jews would have risen up as a community and said, look, you're writing all lies in your writings. So even not only eyewitnesses who love Jesus have given their accounts, hostile eyewitnesses, those who are against Jesus, even they have looked at these writings because these writings were not written hundreds of years later when you can cook up stories and say, ah, Jesus did this miracle, Jesus did that miracle. These records were written when the people who hate Jesus are still alive. And none of them could raise a finger and say, ha, look, you're writing lies. So you see, the accuracy of the New Testament scriptures is very easy to establish. So it was probably in around 40 AD that Corinthians was written. Um, and you know, many of the epistles were, uh, many of these letters which he wrote, he would have written in the 40s and 50s is when he would have written it. So which means like just, just about 50 years after Jesus ascended, He's already writing down these things, and all the churches are reading these things. Mark was probably written in the late 50s. Uh, Matthew and Luke were probably written in the 80s. So Matthew and Luke were written after the Jerusalem fell down, you know, so after the attack of Titus. So um, Mark would have been written in the late 50s. Matthew and Luke were probably written in the 80s. And John was written probably around 90 AD. So that was like the, uh, you know, the last um, um, gospel. And of course, the gospel of John and his letters and revelation were all probably around written around 90 AD. So um, today, do we have anything from that time? We have some copies, uh, you know, of course, we don't have the originals, but then we have uh, very ancient copies which were handwritten in 200 AD. A eight of Paul's epistles and a large portion of Hebrews, copies which were handwritten in 200 AD are available with us today. So in that brief time of 200 years, not much corruption you know, uh, would have happened because uh, the details would be very clear in their minds. And uh, the early church would have made sure that no, no wrong things are being you know, produced. So uh, we can rely upon the authenticity of the New Testament scriptures that have come down to us. Now, um, there's something which critics say about the New Testament. This is what they say. I mean, it's it's uh, you see it on the internet. It says, you know, they they say that the New Testament has got two hundred thousand defects and mistakes, and that sounds like a very large number. So they are saying that there are 200,000 mistakes in the New Testament copies. You know, if, if, if you were to uh, place 10 hand, handwritten copies in front of you and start comparing them, when you start comparing the different copies, according to them, you will be able to find defects. What is there in one document will be different in the other document. So according to them, there are 200,000 variations and differences. But actually, the number which they are quoting is wrong. They are cheating in the sense. Let us say, let's just use an example, a, a fictional example. Let's assume that in one handwritten copy, the copyist made a mistake and he put the wrong spelling for the word gospel. Now. Someone took that document and then another hundred copies were made using that defective document. So which means now all the hundred copies will have a wrong spelling of gospel. So now what do the critics say? They'll say that, oh, there are 101 mistakes. So the same, but actually it's not 101 mistakes, it's one mistake, one spelling mistake, which is repeated a hundred times. But it doesn't mean that there are 101 mistakes. So they, they have a wrong way of calculating the, you know, the variations. And they say there are 200,000 variations. But actually what they're doing is they're repeating the same defect in each document. So the gospel is mis the word gospel is misspelled in, in, in uh, 500 documents. They're saying, oh, there are 500 defects, which is actually not correct. It's just one mistake. And that one mistake has been reproduced in different documents. So actually what they are saying is wrong in reality. 95% of all the documents match. There are, how many are available to us today? 5,520 handwritten copies are available today. I mean, they're available in different museums. 5,520.
20, I think is the number, I don't really remember, that many copies. And if you were to compare all the copies, you will discover that 95% they match. The remaining 5% is the, you know, um, the mistakes and spelling mistakes and things like that. So um, it is, so we can say that the scriptures are highly accurate. The scriptures which have been transmitted down the ages to us are highly accurate. Now, um, it's very um, biased, very prejudiced, the kind of criticisms that, the, that you know these people raise against the Bible. Because when it comes to other ancient writings, they accept them at face value and they say, oh, yeah, these are accurate. But when it comes to the Bible, they come up with all kinds of criticisms. You know, I mean, uh, in the 8th century BC, there was this person named Homer. And he wrote a book called the Iliad. So the Iliad was written by Homer in the 8th century BC. And now today we have 643 handwritten copies of that particular book. And when you compare all the 643 copies, there are mistakes, but most of it is identical. And so based on that, the people today accept that this copies which they have in their hand is matching the original, even though they do not have the original in their hand. On the other hand, you know, when it comes to the, 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 the New Testament, like I said, we have some, somewhere around 5,520 copies. And when you match that many copies, you're able to find ac uh, ident identical content 95%. Only 5% is small variations. So when they're, when they're so happy about accepting the Iliad as being original, why are they so reluctant to accept the Bible as equally you know, original and authentic? So it's actually the prejudice of critics which makes them uh, attack the Bible more than they attack the other ancient writings. Um, another example that is uh, that was given by you know by one uh, Christian um, uh, scholar, he said that the same man Homer he wrote another book in the eighth century. It was called the Odyssey. Now the Odyssey was written by Homer in the eighth century. The earliest handwritten copy that we have of the Odyssey is was copied. 2,200 years later, which means there was a gap of 2,200 years between the original document and the copy which is there in our hands now. Even though there's such a long gap, people are willing to accept that the Odyssey is, is authentic. But when it comes to our scriptures, you know, like I, like I had just told a little while ago, we have epistles, Paul's epistles, which were hand copied in 200 AD. So a gap of just maybe 170 years or so between the original writing and the copy. So you imagine how much more authentic and reliable our New Testament, uh, you know, hand, uh, the handwritten copies will be. Because the time gap between the original and the handwritten copy is much less. It's much narrower. So uh, therefore, we can uh, trust uh, what uh, you know the scriptures which we have with us today so let us le very briefly look at some of the kind of copyist errors which we see in our scriptures okay so that we will have a clearer picture about these things so what are the different um, now many of the copyist errors happened because when the, the person who's copying from the source document may not really understand the handwriting which is used in the source document. So sometimes, especially when it comes to yeah, even the Greek language, but especially when it comes to the Hebrew language, the alphabets are so similar, it's easy to think that one alphabet is actually the other alphabet. You know, because they are so similar in their shape. Uh, and so, sometimes mistakes happened because a person who's copying would think that, that that one alphabet is being used when actually another alphabet is being used. So as a result of that, one example would be Genesis chapter 10 verse 4 and 1 Chronicles chapter 1 verse 7. Now in both of these places, Genesis 10 4 and in 1 Chronicles 1 7, it gives a list of the 
descendants of a person named Jawan. Okay, so this man Jawan, he uh, his descendants are mentioned in both of these places. In Genesis, uh, one of his descendants is referred to as the Dodanim, whereas in the Chronicles passage, the uh, descendants are referred to as the Rodanim. So the uh, the and the Ra got interchanged. That's because the is shaped like this, Ra is also shaped like this. The difference between the and Ra is that the will have a little bit of the top line sticking out. So it, it's like this, but there's a little line sticking out. Ra, on the other hand, is just like this. It's that similar. So which is why some poor person who was copying probably thought that the the is Ra or thought maybe that the Ra is the. We don't, so we don't know whether they're the Rodanim or the Dodanim. You know, small variations like that because of difficulty in understanding the handwriting. Um, so most of the mistakes which took place took place with regard to numbers. You know, the numbering. They would use the Hebrew alphabets to write down their numbers. Uh, so sometimes they would be, uh, they would either, uh, they would, they would, they would understand that alphabet wrongly. And so you would end up with wrong numbers. So for instance, uh, you know, Jehoiakim, when he came to the throne, we don't know how old he was because Second Kings chapter 24 will say that he was 18 years old. But 2 Chronicles 36 will say that he was eight years old. Because you see that the, you know, because 18 is 1 8, right? So we don't know whether the, uh, the uh, copyist added the one over there or whether he removed the one over there. So we don't know whether Jehoiakim was actually 18 or 8 when he came to the throne. But it's just the small matters like this. Um, in the same way, we don't know whether. Um, uh, yeah, in Ezra chapter 2, it says that there were 200 singing men and women. In uh, Nehemiah 7, it says there were 245 singing men and women. Um, so small errors like that, which will not affect teaching in any way, which will not affect doctrine in any way. So most of the mistakes are that type. Where there's a, there's a small change in the name or there's a change in the numbering. Now, sometimes... Uh, when the person who's copying accidentally added an alphabet or removed an alphabet, sometimes it led to a change in the meaning. So in that case, let us say the error was more serious. But even then, no doctrinal matter got affected. It's just that the sentence changed into something else. But the teachings, the important teachings which are contained in the Old Testament and New Testament, those were not affected ever by any of the errors. Um, for example, one very popular, you know, um, copyist error which is discussed generally in the internet uh, would be who killed Goliath. Now, oh, that's actually a very simple answer, right? I mean, we um, because um, where exactly? First, uh, First Samuel chapter 17 verses 45 to 50. If you read that, it's very clearly given how David went, what he did, what he spoke, and how he killed Goliath. It's very, very clear. There's no doubt about it. If anyone who looks at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 to 50, will have a clear picture of exactly who killed Goliath. But this event is mentioned in another place, 2 Samuel 21, 19. And over there in 2 Samuel 21, 19, if you were looking at the original Hebrew, the original Hebrew, you know, um, uh, the Masoretic original Hebrew Bible, which has come down to us, if you were looking at that, the wording over there, it looks like as if Elhanan, the son of Jair, killed Goliath. And that's because there is a copyist error in that particular verse. Now, most of our Bibles will give the correct version. They will say, that Elhanan, the son of Jair, killed the brother of Goliath, not Goliath himself. And in the footnote, they will mention. So if you, you know, if you have your Bible in front of you, if you were to look at 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 19, and if you look at the footnotes for that particular verse, or there it will be written, in the original Hebrew, it does not mention brother of Goliath. It just mentions he killed Goliath. So that's because the person who was doing the copying made a couple of small errors. 
basically the person was copying you know in uh, how do we know what the defect is in second samuel 21:19 because second samuel 21:19 is almost identical with first chronicles chapter 20 verse 5 so the verse which is written in second samuel 21:19 and the verse which is written in first chronicles 20 Five. Both of these verses are almost identical word for word. They're both talking about the same event. So when we compare this Second Samuel twenty-one verse with the First Chronicles twenty verse, we realize what the defect is in Second Samuel twenty-one nineteen. So in Second Samuel twenty-one nineteen, the copyist just basically made two small errors, which led to a complete change in the sentence itself. First mistake he made was. in one particular word he added the word b the second small mistake which he did was another word which has which has got three alphabets he changed the middle alphabet because you know um, those two alphabet alphabets look very same uh, instead of putting k over there he put t because k and t look very identical k is basically like this okay k is basically like this your t is also like this only thing your t will have a small comma attached down below that's the difference so the second mistake which this copyist made was when he was you no know, writing down the second word he changed that second uh, letter which was there and the third letter in that word is just one small stroke one tiny little stroke like this that's it that's an alphabet and that's actually called the yod he forgot to mention that now because of that 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 verse sounds very different from the first chronicles 25 verse and you get the wrong impression that um, elhanan killed goliath rather than uh, you know the verse which actually should be saying that he killed the brother of goliath so sometimes these very small errors led to a change in the entire sentence but it doesn't affect the teaching because we have another passage which clearly talks about who killed goliath so even though small errors did take place sometimes it did not affect the doctrine of the bible in any manner now um okay this um people use the term textual variants so oh, that's basically means if i am placing 10 handwritten copies in front of me so i have basically 10 texts in front of me and then i see small variations between the 10 texts the spelling over here is one thing and the spelling over here is another thing so those are textual variants now small small uh, spelling mistakes don't really affect us in any way but sometimes you see an entire bible passage missing from one of the old manuscripts and that is when people start you know criticizing and they say oh my was this additional passage added later was it not there in the original thing or is it was it you know missed out accidentally it leads to you know controversies like that so there are three such controversies which maybe we should you know keep in mind uh because it's um you know it, it it's important uh it, it um, because especially the muslim community criticizes the church regarding these three uh passages um so let's look at the um first one okay before we look at the first one maybe we need to have a little background now you might have heard people you know raise this criticism yeah just go ahead yeah oh usually like uh, when uh, someone is like you know uh, in when we are in conversation with someone and uh, rather than clarity just for the sake of discussion and disrupting you know thing if they keep asking such questions and thing is it wise to just refrain or seek some time and respond or is it okay to you know get into the conversation and thing because their primary objective is not about getting clarity it's more about just trying to confuse us so what would be the right uh, you know we especially when we are talking about muslim community so, it, it all depends on whom you are having the discussion with because you know uh, recently someone had sent me some youtube clip clippings 
of this uh, gentleman wearing white, uh, you know, that Arabic kind of thing, and is attacking some Christian and saying, look, do you know that this Bible passage is contradicting this Bible passage? What is your answer to that? And another poor Christian is looking very puzzled and doesn't even know what to say. You know, so when that person is in full onslaught mode and attacking, maybe even if this person speaks up and says something, maybe it really wouldn't work because that man is trying to prove his point and he's in a very um, aggressive uh, you know, state of mind. So in such settings, maybe it would be better to just be quiet and leave it at that. On the other hand, if someone seems to have a cool mind and they seem open to an actual discussion, then maybe you could talk about how there are textual variants, how there are spelling mistakes, but there are no mistakes in the original manuscript. And you can go into a discussion of that if the person seems open and receptive to having a discussion. But when a person is in attack mode and they just want to prove their point because they are so heated up in their mind, they may not really be open. It will only end, uh, lead to an argument. And because that person has spent months researching that topic and now is coming and attacking you, you may not still have that required research from your side to be able to combat. So in such situations, it would be better to just you know, pray silently and leave it. But if you know that person personally, and if you get an opportunity to someday bring up the topic again, after you have done your preparation, you could always reopen the topic. So it would, it would always depend on whom you're talking to and the uh, state of mind of the person. What is their motive in having brought up this whole conversation? Is it, uh, they, did they just want to attack Christians? Or are they genuinely wanting to know what my outlook is regarding this particular thing then i can present you know i can op openly present what i uh, and uh, so yes we are not all well researched regarding these matters so when such a thing happens maybe the wise thing would be to say uh, i don't really know the answer to this but i'll definitely find out you know i'll talk to someone or i will look up that and then i'll get back to you and then we can talk about it so that way it kind of keeps the door open where you can actually go back one day with better equipped with better information and actually have a discussion with that person. And you know, even as you're praying inside your heart, who knows the Holy Spirit may convict that person and you know point out to them the authenticity of the Christian scriptures. You know? So that would actually help. So I guess it would it's all a matter of setting. Uh, based on the setting, you would take your step accordingly. Um, all right. Some people raise this question and they say, this NIV Bible, it leaves out entire passages. What a terrible thing to do. So on the other hand, the NKJV has got all these passages which are correctly in place. Why or not does NIV do that? Why does it just throw out certain passages and don't even include them? You know, that's one uh, argument which people make. So just for us to understand a little bit about the background of that, because that will help us to understand more about this textual variations which critics attack us uh, you know, about. Now, the King James Version was uh, the, the English translation uh, was done in the 16th or 17th century. At that time, whatever documents they had, the manuscripts which they had in their hand, they use those manuscripts faithfully, sincerely to do the English translation. So uh, most of the, uh, the manuscripts which they had in their hands were the handwritten copies from around um, 600 AD, 700 AD, all the way up to 900 AD. So the documents which they had in their hand, those were handwritten copies ranging from 600 AD to 900 AD. Those are called the Byzantine manuscripts. So the KJV was translated into English based on the Byzantine manuscripts. At that time, the more ancient manuscripts had not even been discovered. It was only in the 1900s that archaeologists accidentally discovered older manuscripts from 200 AD, you know, like the one we were talking about, the epistles of uh, uh, Paul, which are available, which were uh, handwritten around 200 AD. And also they have found, they found two um, in the early 1900s, they found two complete copies of the New Testament, one which was handwritten in 325 AD and another which was written in 350 AD. These two copies have the complete New Testament in them. 
so these are also part of the alexandrian documents now in the 17th century the, the people who did the translation for the kgv never even had these documents in their hands simply because they had not been discovered it was only much later in the 1900s that these older more original alexandrian manuscripts came to light and when a comparison was done between the byzantine documents and the alexandrian documents people realized that the byzantine manuscripts seem to be longer in length in fact they have 6000 extra words so the older more ancient alexandrian manuscripts have less amount of words the byzantine manuscripts have much more 6000 extra words so people began to think maybe as time went by just to give a little clearer explanation maybe some you know some of the copyists added some extra things into the documents so which is why niv and many of the modern uh, translations they prefer to do their translation directly from the alexandrian manuscripts rather than the byzantine manuscripts which is why sometimes some passages are left out because those passages were not there in the more ancient earlier uh, manuscripts so based on that they will put it in the footnote saying that the earliest manuscripts do not have this passage they'll just explain and they will not mention that passage in the in the um, you know in the content so which is why there's a difference between um, niv and the other modern translations when we compare it with kjv and nkjv which are based on the byzantine uh, manuscripts so um this being the case uh let us look at some uh, passages which uh, which are considered controversial mm. on the other hand we may not have time to go through all of them okay we will talk about textual variants maybe in the first hour of next class and then enter into doctrine of god in the second hour uh today maybe we can talk about another small aspect i want to cover the you know this controversial passages properly so we will do that in the first hour of our next session uh and then in the second hour of our next session we'll get into the doctrine of god um the reason that i spent more time on the doctrine of the word of god is because our entire faith is and our, and our entire lives are based on this word of god so it is very important for us to have a clear picture about its origins about its transmission about the arguments which are raised against it so okay so we will not spend this much time on all the other doctrines uh, so but this was something important uh, so we will look at these controversial passages um, uh, briefly in the next class but today i would really like to touch upon our translations i mean now that we actually brought up this whole idea about you know niv and kjv and all of that um there are some people who ask you know they say um, are all the translations correct because if you compare two bibles you know two translations and keep them next to each other the verse says something completely different the verse looks almost completely different so which version is more accurate now the simple truth is this all the people who have done the english translations from the bottom of their heart they wanted to translate as accurately as possible nobody did a light hearted translation just like that for the fun of it because when you when 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 uh, you know a particular uh, translation team sits down to do the translation work it's something that they do over many years they check they cross check they look at the meaning of those original words they look at what all the scholars are saying about the meaning of those words and then they translate literally word by word sentence by sentence it's done very carefully to use an example when niv was trying to bring out its second edition they had um they had five or six teams and five or six teams would work on the same bible passage and then they would come together to see how each team has translated that particular passage and so then based on the differences in the translation they would uh, you know sit and discuss and debate and decide which is the best way to do this passage 
So for every single passage, you would have three, four teams working on the same passage and then comparing and contrasting to see which is the best one, which, which, you know, which should finally be undertaken. No translation was ever done carelessly, ever. So whichever Bible version you're holding in your hands, please know that hundreds of people worked day and night, most prayerfully, most sincerely to bring out the translation which you're holding in your ha hand. So don't just criticize any of the translations and say, ah, these people didn't, you know, they didn't even care what they were writing. Now, maybe you can say that about the paraphrases, but not about the actual translations. What do I mean by that? Let's, uh, we, we'll talk about it. There are basically three kinds of English Bibles that we have. There are Bibles which use what is called a formal translation method. So Bibles which have a formal translation method they are interested in doing literal word by word translation of the original Hebrew and the original Greek. So they will take that original Hebrew sentence and then they will try to translate it literally word by word. So that is called your formal translation method. And for them, the main emphasis for them, the goal is to be as accurate as possible, literally word by word translating. So they are not that interested in making the verse understandable to the modern reader. For them, accuracy is important. So they don't emphasize on the, on the modern reader understanding the meaning. They're more interested in preserving the accuracy. Which are the translations uh, you know, which use this formal translation approach? Uh, you have NKJV, of course. And then you have uh, NASB. You have the ESV. Uh, you have the NASU, you have the HCSB. Now, these are all, you know, which will have a literal word-to-word -word translation. So, if you're looking for that kind of accuracy, these are the translations which are best. But for them, the important uh, point is not bring, bringing out the meaning. So, you have a second translation method which have been used by other translators. That is called the functional translation method. Here, the goal is not to you know, preserve that Hebrew-Greek structure exactly. The goal is to bring out the meaning which is contained in, the, in that particular sentence. So when they are doing the translation, they will not do a literal word-by-word -word translation. They do their best to bring out the original meaning which is there in that. Let's use an example. So Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Now, I don't think any of you have a KJV Bible with you, but if you had a KJV Bible with you, Acts 10.34, this is the way the, the, the verse would be uh, you know, rendered over there. Acts 10.34, it says, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. That is your actual literal KJV translation, where it says, God is no respecter of persons. Why on earth would they write something like that? That is because the Greek word which is used over there, that word literally means uh, an acceptor or respecter of a face or an acceptor or respecter of a person. So they wanted to literally translate that. And so in your original in Acts 10.34, you know, the English KJV, it will say, God is no respecter of persons. But that meaning sounds very wrong to our modern ears. It almost sounds like as if God doesn't have respect for people. But that is not what they were trying to convey in the Greek word. The Greek word is saying, I don't care what your face is, whether you're a rich man or a poor man. I'm not a respecter of faces. I care about treating people equally. That actually is the Greek meaning. But when you do this literal translation, the meaning of that word doesn't come out. So which is why, in fact, even NKJV also follows the you know, the more uh, loose translation. So NKJV, NIV, this is the way they translate it. They say, God does not show favoritism. So that term, God does not show favoritism, is not a word-by-word -word translation. The actual word-by-word -word translation would be, God is not a respecter of faces or respecter of persons. But the actual meaning is, God does not show favoritism. He treats everyone equally. So you see the functional translations have tried to bring out the meaning of what is being said. So that would be your NIV, NLT, GNT, NCV. Uh, these are all your functional translation where they're not translating word by word. They are rather translating thought by thought. 
they want to bring out the actual meaning of the thought which was conveyed in the original so they want to convey that it's a third kind of translations which exist today and these are what you call the paraphrases these are not very accurate they are more um, reader friendly but they are not accurate living bible and the message bible are two very popular paraphrases the living bible was written by a man who got his name he basically wanted to write uh, translate the bible for his child for his son in in simple english in a way which his son will be able to understand so he is not very accurate in the way he translates uh, in fact he gives in some places it's like, it's almost as if his interpretation of those verses is coming out so it's very very simple very readable very re uh, reader friendly but it's not very accurate because it's a paraphrase it's not an actual translation it's a paraphrase of the original now i grew up on the living bible my from from childhood uh, because that was the easiest bible available so my father presented it to me and i think up to 10th standard i lived on the living bible and so by the time i came to my 10th standard i knew what is there in each chapter in the bible i mean I, i knew all the thoughts and ideas which are there and then i was able to move to nkjv because the nkjv english is high and you half the time you don't know what on earth they're talking about because i had already become familiar with the scriptures in the living bible it was easy for me to you know move from there to nkjv and understand what is being said so for some people a paraphrase may be easy to read but do not expect accuracy all right so you have basically have these three types of translations available and uh, so based on uh, what you are looking for whether you are looking for readability or whether you are looking for accuracy you would choose the translation which you feel is best for uh, you so when you are presenting a bible to a new believer you know as a gift it would be best if you don't give them the word to word translations it would be maybe more if they are if they are comfortable with english you know and they read journals and they read um, you know newspapers and they're comfortable with that level of english a uh, functional translation would be, would be better you know like niv or uh, gnt or nlt because the english in that is easier to understand but of course maybe it's not a good idea to give anybody the paraphrase because the paraphrase is not emphasizing accuracy so the message bible is something that you read for the fun of it just to see you know what in what new twist they have given to the verses uh, it's interesting the way they they write some of the verses it's interesting to read but uh, when it comes to accuracy of translation that that is not found in your paraphrases so um, those are all the things that we could touch upon uh, today there are a few aspects of this doctrine of the word of god which we have left out i will quickly cover those things in the first hour of our next session so you know let's just close with a word of prayer Lord we just thank you that you guarded your word through the ages so oh lord you you placed people in the right positions at the right time to make sure that your word was transmitted accurately so that it will come to us the modern reader in all of its power with no corruption we thank you oh lord for what you have done for us and we thank you oh lord that you gave us your very own direct words so that we can use them to bring life to our bodies to bring life to our inner spirit so that we can grow in you and have a new life in you we thank you o lord for this word of god and we pray o lord that we would be people uh, who would spend time meditating upon this word uh, discipline ourselves and carve out the necessary time to spend meditating upon this word because a lot of people went through a lot to be able to present this bible to us today and lord we should not neglect it so we pray that you would help us to become sincere disciplined students of your word thank you lord in jesus name amen